What up, fam? Welcome to the Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. On today's episode, I'm gonna show you how to make this, uh, this badass beer from scratch. And when I say from scratch, I mean from a tree in the forest and a tiny chunk of metal to this pokey stick of death and ender of watermelons that you see before you. Now, there is a lot going on with this project, so without much further ado, let's level up this skill. Prepping the shaft. So first things first, I need to source the shaft of my spear. And this is honestly the one portion of it that has stopped me from doing this project in the past. It is surprisingly difficult to find a piece of hardwood stock with the right dimensions in either like the big box stores or any of the lumber yards around me. My backyard on the other hand. Well, it took me about an hour. I was eventually able to find a big old piece of maple with a relatively straight section. I cut off an unwanted length from one end before deciding on the height I liked and cutting all the rest of the excess wood away. Next, I used a draw knife to clear away any of the bark and employed my Viking axe of pillaging to remove any protrusions from branches or whatnot. I also used the axe to get one end roughly to the diameter I was looking for and chase that diameter down the shaft with my draw knife. Then finally, I just hit it with some sandpaper to get it all smooth and uniform. And this, this is where tragedy struck. So I have been a martial artist since I was eight, and this was starting to look like a really cool staff. So I decided to give it a try. And I, I broke it, <laughs> I broke it real bad. Just like that, three hours of work down the tube with a resounding crack. So there's like this, this movement we'd usually do to assess uh, the weight of a staff, at least a single-headed stick, the feel of it, and just kind of how springy it is. And we would usually use waxwood, which is kind of springier anyways. Unfortunately, doing that particular motion with dry limbs of questionable quality, this happens, and this happens. And that is precisely what happened with this piece. That being said, the rest of it is still really nice maple, and I think I'm gonna turn it into like an ax handle or something. You'll definitely see these in future projects. So look at that, that's really pretty, the grain, it's really nice. Anyways, determined not to make that mistake again, I started over again, but this time with green wood freshly cut from a tree. And this went way quicker. The bark just kind of glided off, and the wood beneath was super smooth. And it was also really, really easy to work. The end result was this beautiful maple staff that's springy enough to stand up to whatever force I put on it. Now there was a pretty good bend in the end of it after I had let it dry out for a couple of days, but just heating up the offending area over a fire and bending against that curve, I was able to straighten it out pretty nicely. And with that, we can give this step the shaft and move on to forging the head. So I was heartbroken to find that the metal scrap yard that I usually source my like leaf springs or whatever I need for steel no longer lets me scale the piles of rusty metal to find what I need. Something about liability and people ranting about tetanus. Fortunately, I did happen to find this bad boy out in the wild. It was really encrusted and gnarly, and I think it used to be a forklift tine. At least that's what it looks like to me. But when I did the spark test, it looks like it's a kind of metal that can be hardened. It actually seems to be pretty good quality. So, beggars can't be choosers. And if you're confused by that and you're like, oh, what the hell's a spark test? Check out the beginning of this video right here where I talk about it. So with a small chunk of this steel in hand and a crackling forge, I got started. Quick note. As you can see from that last clip there, I use those little charcoal briquettes that you usually use for like your grill. It's all I had and I just want to tell you, it is the worst source of, of forge fuel that you could possibly use. It burns away super fast and messy and the little burning chaff that goes over like gets in everywhere and continues to burn. It was falling into my gloves and I'm all, all tooled up here. Just a miserable experience all around. I ended up getting this lump charcoal instead, and the difference was night and day. Seriously, stay away from the briquettes. Anyways, with my steel now glowing a deep red, I got to forging. Drawing out my stock to a point and trying to thin the blade evenly, just to save the amount of grinding I need to do later. So I feel like I learn a pretty good deal whenever I do one of these projects, but this session in particular, I feel like there was a bunch of little revelations for myself. Firstly, I really kind of realized that although I'm striking with that hammer, a good deal of the work is being done by the anvil itself. Like as you can see here, I'm hitting the steel and it's deforming really nicely around the curve of the anvil. 
Not only that, but you can really kind of drag the metal. So where I'm trying to thin out those edges, I'm hitting and pulling back at the same time, kind of dragging that metal with me. I also learned two more little quick things where one is the benefit of just keeping a rhythm, even if you're kind of using the anvil to, to tap when you're not actually tapping the metal itself. Keeping that rhythm really made the work flow a little better. And also some of you metal workers can tell me in the comments if it's just my imagination, but I felt like I could hear the difference in the metal when it started to get too cold to work anymore. It went from like kind of a dull thud to a, a more of a ping kind of resonating sound. Again, it might just be my imagination, but I'm pretty sure I could hear that. And that's the really cool thing about leveling up these skills. As you get more comfortable with the process, you really start to notice all these subtle little nuances in, in the skill. Now, because I wanted the spearhead to have this kind of socket attachment, I flattened up the stock opposite to the point into this fan shape. Then I just carefully rolled it over to form the socket. And this is the one bit of the whole build that I'm not particularly pleased with. Because I'm not experienced enough to know kind of, you know, how much metal I actually need to finish the project that I'm working on, I end up not really leaving enough metal for how much needed to wrap around. And it started to thin out so much that the edges started to get a little ragged and break. But at the end of the day, it does the job and I did learn a lot from it. So I call that a win. So with that spearhead all roughed out and actually looking really straight, I further honed the shape with my grinder and smooth the whole piece out with a belt sander. And at this point, it is 100% looking like a spearhead, but it won't hold a tip or an edge because the metal is still soft from working it on the forge. More specifically, from the temperatures you reach in the forge. To fix that, let's move on to hardening and tempering. So hardening is where you bring the temperature of the steel somewhere up to the 1,950 degree range and then quench it to cool it off really fast. This causes martensite to form in the metal, making it really hard. On the upside, when it's this hard, it can actually hold an edge. The downside though is it's also really brittle, so any force you put on it could cause it to shatter. To solve this issue, you need to bring the temperature of the steel back up to between 347 degrees and 662 degrees for about two hours, and then let it cool back down to room temperature slowly. This will get you to that happy medium place where the metal is hard enough to hold an edge, but supple enough so it doesn't shatter upon impact. Now, because I have no real way of telling what temperature my metal is in a forge, here's a fun little tip to know exactly when you should quench. Steel is magnetic, obviously. At a certain temperature though, it loses this feature. It's at this point when it's ready to be quenched. Oh, and by the way, my quenching liquid here is just regular canola oil. You'll know you did this process right when a file will skate right across the edge of the metal without biting in at all. Then it was back to the sander to clean up my freshly hardened spearhead. And with that looking damn sexy, I set my oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit and left the spearhead to bake for two hours. Oh, and here's another really cool piece of info. You'll know when this step is done correctly because your steel will have turned a really pretty straw color. So as you heat up metal, you'll see that it changes color from like the silver of steel to like a straw color and then a purple and then finally like a really flat gray at the end with a whole bunch of gradients in the middle. That straw color only appears within the temperature range we stated that the tempering process actually takes effect. And just using some sandpaper, I was easily able to shine that spearhead right back up. Okay, so that is a spearhead. It went from a little chunk of metal and with fire and anvil and hammer, I turned it turned it into a spearhead. That's awesome. Yeah, I love making stuff. That's neat. Now that we have the shaft and we have the spearhead, it's time to move on to attaching the head. So this step is actually really simple. I started by assessing just how far down the head will sit and making a mark. Then I simply carved the wood away, testing the fit and removing material that was in the way until the socket seated exactly where I wanted it. Next, I used a 1 8 inch drill bit to go all the way through the metal and the wood of the shaft and out the other side. For a rivet, I'm using this steel nail. I simply cut off the tip and place the nail through my holes. Then, using a ball peen hammer, I mushroom the cut end of the nail until it's big enough not to slide out. Finally, I nipped the other side and hammered that down as well, locking the head into place. And it was a spear at this point. Not only that, but the balance was actually really good. Now, forgive my terrible spear work, but just messing around with it, it felt really smooth and not at all as heavy as I worried it would be. 
I also felt my Ninja Turtle shirt was wildly appropriate for this. So I feel like it's absolutely obligatory to assault some sort of a melon when testing a weapon on YouTube. That or a bottle of water, and I don't understand why people attack jugs of water all the time with weapons. Is that like a good analog for people? A jug of water? Do I feel like a jug of water? This isolation stuff's making me gain weight. But before any kind of juicy massacre can take place, I first opted to throw on some of this Danish oil just to protect the wood and give the grain a little bit of extra color. Then I set up my combatant in the field of battle and... Holy crap. So honestly, I thought just like the tip would kind of stick in with minimal damage, but this smooth transition from kind of the bladed area to the shaft area was devastating. And look what happens when I throw it. <laughs> to hell with Fruit Ninja, I'm a Fruit Spartan, just demolishing melons from a distance. I wonder, fair viewer, if it would disturb you to know that once I destroyed my foe, I ate of his flesh. Mmm, victory is delicious. Now with this epicness established, I decided to add just a bit more flair with this leather wrap that you know I love so much. And there you have it, one beautiful and deadly spear made from absolute scratch. Is it perfect? No, but it's awesome and it's mine and I love it. If you love it or at least liked what you saw here today, why don't you hit me with some of that thumbs up love and do not forget to subscribe so you know when I release new content. I gotta really try hard not to gesticulate too much because it's really, really sharp and I'm gonna like skewer myself. Also, if you have any skills you'd like to see covered, why don't you leave it in the comment section and I will add it to the list. Finally, I just wanted to give one quick shout out to my Diamond Orangutan tier Patreons. Rock and Irish Woodshop, Jeff Gogan, Chris Curtis, and Cody Gable, you keep the lights on and keep this thing running. I really appreciate your support. You guys freaking rock. And if any of you want to support what I do here, link to the Patreon is down in the description. Also, just the fact that you watch the video all the way to the end here is a huge help. The YouTube algorithm takes into account how much of a video you watch. So, like, this is already awesome. Thank you so much. All right, fam. Well, I got to get going. The Watermelon Army has found the mountain pass, and 299 of my Skill Monkey cohorts need my help holding it. In the meantime, keep leveling up, you.